Kia ora and good evening and welcome to this, our 10-year budget webinar tonight uh, that has a special focus on central Auckland. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to tune in tonight on what is uh, the first day of our fourth lockdown here uh, in Tamaki Makoro, Auckland. Um, and we hope that we can keep you good company this evening uh, on this beautiful Auckland uh, sunny day on the last day of February. My name is James Riffis. I work in the Regulatory Services Directorate at Auckland Council. And it's my pleasure to be your host for this evening. And along with me, uh, I hope you can see what I see because we have the Brady Bunch of Auckland Council with us today. Uh, and I say that in the, in the nicest possible way. Um, and I'll just introduce people as we go. Um, I think now folks, uh, don't take yourselves off mute. Just give a nice smiley wave and smile to our audience tonight so that they can see you. Um, and, and tonight we have uh, Deputy Mayor and Councillor for the Franklin Ward, Bill Cashmore. Good evening, Bill. We have Councillor for the Waitamata and Golf Ward, Pippa Coombe. We have Councillor for the Albert Eden Pukitipapa Ward, Kathy Casey. <laughs> we have Councillor for the Menu Rewa Papakura Ward, Angela Duncan. We have Councillor for the Waitakere Ward, Shane Henderson. Thank you, Shane. We have Councillor for the Orake Ward, Desley Simpson. And I know Desley is here, but you might not be able to see her face. And we have Councillor for the Albert Eden Pukitipapa Ward, Christine Fletcher, who I also know is here. And I'm not sure if her video is working just yet, but it will be soon. Good evening, Christine. Also joining us are some of our board chairs from the central area. Uh, we have Albert Eden local board chair, Maggie Watson. We have Waitamata local board chair, Richard Northey. And I'm not sure if we have any other local board chairs just yet. If we do, I will look back into you later in the evening. Finally, from Auckland Council, we have Andrew Duncan, who's our Manager of Financial Policy. Evening, Andrew. We have Alec Tan, who's our Chief Sustainability Officer. Good evening, Alec. We have Anna Jennings, our Lead Planner. And we have Michael Burns, who's the Manager of Financial Strategy. Wow. So our session this evening is gonna take about 90 minutes. Uh, it will be recorded and it will be made available on our website alongside the questions and responses. And we'd really love questions from you throughout the evening. You'll see in the bottom of your screen, a Q&A uh, little icon, and you can click on that and ask questions. Um, uh, we're gonna start though with a brief presentation about the 10 year budget and then commence uh, the Q&A session with our panel. I'm actually gonna start off by asking uh, our councillors some questions, and then we'll move on to our local board chairs. If you've got anything specific uh, that you'd like to know about your local board area as it relates to the 10-year budget, feel free to, to ask those and I'll, I'll answer, oh, sorry, I'll put those to our local board chairs later in the evening. Um, this consultation is really important and we, we're genuinely glad that you're here. Uh, I encourage you to visit the Auckland Have Your Say website, which is akhaveyoursay.aucklandcouncil.gov.nz, uh, so that you can actually officially have your say on this 10-year budget. Uh, we'll put the link to that in the chat later in the evening. Um, so yes, feel free to shoot through any questions that you have and we'll ask the panel. In the meantime though, we are going to start with a presentation uh, by our friends at Council, Michael Burns and Andrew Duncan and they'll be presenting an overall presentation about the budget that we're talking about tonight. So, Michael, are you ready to go and ready to share your screen? Excellent. I'll pass it on to you now, Michael. Here we are. So, kia ora all, um, and welcome to our recovery budget, our 10-year budget. So, I'm Michael Burns from the Council's Finance team, and alongside me, my colleague Andrew Duncan will be walking through the key regional issues we want to hear from Aucklanders on over the next month. So councils across the country prepare 10-year budgets, often called long-term plans, every three years. They look at the activities the council will focus on and how they will fund them. I don't think it comes as a surprise to anyone, especially not today, that this is not a business as usual 10-year budgeting process. The world is, is quite different at the moment. So hearing from Aucklanders on our plans is a key part of the process 
and we want to hear from as many as we can. So your input will support the elected members, many of whom are here to listen to you tonight, um, in their final decisions they make in June. So the council, like so many others, is feeling significant impacts of COVID-19. We're projecting to lose around a billion dollars in revenue over the next four years. Meanwhile, we still need to plan for the projected growth of the city and to look after the infrastructure that delivers the services we all value. We also need to face up to the challenges of climate change, both in terms of emissions reduction and in adaptation to a changing climate. This is why we're referring to this as our recovery budget. So the real challenge behind this budget is one of balance. On one hand, we have an increased need for the council to invest, while on the other, we've got less availability of funds to make this investment. So I've already mentioned Auckland's growth, infrastructure needs and climate change, but we also need to continue the work we've started on our transport network. We need to ensure our activities match the changing needs of our people, and we need to play our part in supporting the recovery from COVID-19. So on the other side, we still have, we have less capacity to invest. We've talked about the reductions in expected revenue due to COVID, but we also need to be careful how much we borrow, ensure we maintain headroom in case there are any further shocks that we feel. Large sections of the funding we, we do have is already committed through major projects, such as the CRL and the Central Interceptor. And we also need to consider the overall impact of the funding options we do propose on the community that we serve. So this draft plan looks at five key issues. Our first issue is around our proposed investment package. This is essentially our response to the balancing challenge in the last slide. So we're proposing to invest $31 billion in Auckland over the next 10 years. The timing of this investment is crucial given the challenges we're facing. So our proposal enables this investment to average 2.9 billion each year for the next three years. This is 900 million more than we could otherwise be able to afford. So we had to do, have to do something to achieve this. To achieve it, we will continue our focus on savings and value and lock in at least $90 million of permanent ongoing annual savings. As we did in the emergency budget, we'll look to release $70 million a year over the next three years by selling or leasing surplus properties. We'll look to increase our borrowing to a temporarily higher ratio of our revenue for the first three years and then gradually reduce it thereafter. And we're also looking to stick with rates increases of 3.5% per annum over the long term, but to have a higher rates increase of 5% for the next year. So with this additional investment, this enables us to, to do more in these first, particularly in these first three years. It enables us to invest half a billion dollars more into Auckland's transport network where ever, everyone can see that it's, it's needed. It allows us to accelerate the renewals work and look after our underground infrastructure and our piped water networks. It also allows $65 million of additional spending on parks and community, so to deliver things in local areas. It also allows us to act earlier on restoration that's needed for our art gallery, and also to commence work on addressing health and safety concerns around our closed landfill sites. And those are just some examples of the things we're able to accelerate and to, to leverage up investment in those first few years if we pull those funding levers. So the second key issue is about climate change. So it's not down to the council to tackle climate change on our own, but we want to lead from the front. We're already doing a lot of work to tackle emissions, including phasing out gas boilers in our aquatic centres, introducing more electric vehicles into our fleet, and providing walking, cycling, and public transport options. What we're proposing in this budget and included in the package that I've just talked about is an extra 150 million dollars of investment to do new things, which include cancelling the purchase of any new diesel buses. From this year, we want to purchase only electric 
or hydrogen powered buses. It also includes some big planting projects in both street trees and increasing the size of native forest in our area. And also improving the efficiency of our facilities. So our third key issue is around responding to growth in Auckland. Over the next 10 years, we're expecting 260,000 more people to call Auckland home. Our unitary plans enabled the development of more than a million homes in existing residential areas and 137,000 more in our planned future urban areas. We need to provide infrastructure and services to support this development, but we can't afford to do it all now. So what we're proposing is to focus our resources on a few key locations. They include areas where the government um, agreed with the government as part of the Auckland Housing Program, Mount Roskill, Tamaki, Mangari, and, um, and North Coast. We also, also where there's other significant government investment plans such as in Drury and other and areas of the Northwest. And also where, there's, where we're investing in other big projects like CRL and leveraging off those. Our fourth key issue is about investing in our community. We need to be more adaptable in how we provide community services. So councils have traditionally provided community services using a large network of buildings and other properties. Over time, the needs of our communities have and are changing. So we need to be more adaptable in how we provide community services to keep up with those changing needs. So with much of our investment locked into aging community buildings and facilities, we're spending more and more every year on renewals and maintenance. This detracts from the amount we can spend delivering the services that Aucklanders actually want from us. So this recovery budget is proposing a move away from this asset dominated approach to community services. We propose to consider how we can better use partnerships, grants, digital and non-asset based approaches more tailored to the community needs. Over time, implementation of this new approach would see us closing some of our assets if they're not fit for purpose and reinvest that into services and facilities that better meet the needs of our communities. Our fifth issue is around protecting and enhancing our environment. So the previous 10 year budget accelerated actions to improve our water quality and our natural environment and funded these through two new target rates. What we're proposing is to extend and increase this investment so that we can continue to invest in different parts of the city. So the pro budget proposes to extend the water quality targeted rate past its currently planned end date of 2028 out to 2031. So we can continue to invest in different parts of the city. And it also proposes to increase this rate in line with the projected average increase in general rates. This will be an increase for the average value property of $3.30. What this will enable us to, ex to do is to extend our water quality work to do more in the Manukau Harbour, in the Tamaki Estuary, and in the beaches stretching from Parnell to Glendowley, and with the increase for this construction work to start in 22-23, rather than six years later. It will also fund additional litter trap work across the entire region, which will help remove contaminants and improve the quality of both our fresh water and our coastal water. With the natural environment targeted rate, we're proposing to extend that from 2028 to the end of this plan in 2031 to allow us to continue to do the work in areas such as Kari dieback and in reducing in our predator and weed control. Our plan also includes a number of other key priorities, including Māori outcomes. The council is committed to a treaty-based partnership with Māori. So we enable delivery against 10 Māori outcomes, strategic priorities through our Māori outcomes portfolio. And this portfolio includes day-to-day -day activities supplemented by the targeted use of the Māori outcomes fund, which is $150 million over the next 10 years. So some examples of this um, in action are the Marae Infrastructure Programme, which helps Marae to be healthy and sustainable cultural hubs, and Tikete Rukuruku, which is returning names 
to parks and places across Tamaki Makaurau and helps ensure the Māori language is seen, heard, spoken and learned in everyday life. We also continue our focus on social investment. So this recovery budget reinstates the congestible funds that were reduced as part of the emergency budget. We're also proposing to embed a $500,000 a year annual operational fund to work with other organisations to support homeless people and to continue the work with the Southern Initiative and the Western Initiative, which will help disadvantaged sections of our community with skills training and employment pathways. So I just want to hand over to Andrew now to talk about what this means from a, a rates perspective. Good evening. So the expenditure that Michael's talked about, that we need to support those key investments in the city, how does that translate into your rates? Well, for the average value residential property, $1.08 million, that'll be an annual increase in rates of $150. And that includes the water quality targeted rate increase of $3.30 a year that Michael referred to, as well as a small increase in the base waste management rate. For a business property, the average value business property in Auckland is $2.84 million. The increase will be $583. You can find out exactly how your property will be affected by going to the rates guide at AK Have Your Say. That's on the next slide, Michael. Please. So on this, you'll be able to see the what your rates will be for your property, how much they'll go up, and what the components of that change are. And we've got a few other changes to rates that are being proposed for this year. And you'll also be able to, if your property is affected by that, you'll be able to see that at that rates guide page. At present, we charge 90% of the value-based general rate to properties in the rural parts of Auckland, to business and residential properties. And we charge farm lifestyle properties all across Auckland, 80% of the value-based general rate that applies to the capital value of your property. The boundary between urban and rural rates was set in 2011-2012. And a lot's changed in that. Auckland's growing fast. Urban development is taking place at the edges of the city. And council services are becoming more available at urban levels further away from the city than they were before. So we're proposing to extend the urban rating area this year. So all the land that's able to be developed for urban purposes will be attracting urban rates, except Walkworth where the service levels haven't reached urban levels yet. Now this means that neighbouring properties or nearby properties with similar access to services will pay the same rates. We're also proposing that farm lifestyle properties within the urban rating area will pay the urban residential rate. These, these are the properties that are able to be developed that won't include farm lifestyle properties within the urban rating area that can't be developed. So we're not going to include some of our key productive urban land in that. Within that consultation, we've identified Kumi and Herpai as potentially coming into the urban rating area, but noted while their service levels are higher than most of their rural neighbours, they're not quite as high as similar urban areas. So that's a particular question we're looking for feedback on. But the key driver for this proposal is that properties with similar access to service pay similar rates to their neighbours. We also have a few other changes affecting specific properties or areas. So we have an accommodation provider targeted rate where accommodation providers 
make a contribution towards the cost of our expenditure on visitor attraction, major events, and destination marketing. We suspended that for a year last year when the borders closed and international visitors stopped being able to come to New Zealand. We also cut our spending accordingly. The council's now looking to when it should reinstate the rate, and there are three options in the consultation materials. The end of the one year suspension, which will be the 1st of April this year, or the 1st of January 2022, or 1st of July 2022. We're also proposing to put a rate on Vector, and we'll use the revenue for that to do enhanced management of trees near power lines. And this will mean that we can improve the public safety around power lines and make the electricity network more resilient and improve the security of electricity supply. Only Vector will pay this rate. Now we have a city centre targeted rate that applies to city residents and businesses in the city centre and we use the revenue from that to make additional investments in making the city a better place to live, work and visit. This rate expires in 2024-25. We're proposing to extend it for the life of this 10-year plan to allow us to continue that investment. We're also proposing to introduce a bus service from Paramaramo to Albany to allow Paramaramo residents to connect with the wider public transport network. This service will be funded by a targeted rate on the residents in the Parimarima area. We're also introducing a stormwater service, we're not introducing a stormwater service, a reintroducing a targeted rate to fund the stormwater services provided in Tiari and Okahukura. These are the only rural areas of Auckland that still have a council stormwater service. The targeted rate would apply to the properties that benefit from the service. There's a few small changes to our business improvement district targeted rates. There's also a, a ballot on the properties that will be affected in those areas, Manurewa, Glen Innes, and Dominion Road. There is also some changes we're consulting on to our fees and charges, some adjustment to some of our animal management fees and to our building and resource consent fees. In addition, a key issue is our proposal to remove library late return fees. Now each year about 35,000 of our library members stop using our services because they owe us even small sums like $10. We want to make sure these people keep using the services and we believe that removing the fines would encourage them to do that. However, there'll be a loss of about a million dollars per year in revenue associated with getting that benefit. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. So we want as many people from across Auckland to, to be involved in this process as we can. And the best way is, is through the website that James mentioned earlier. So it's akhaveyoursay.nz. Um, and in there, you can, um, you can either type out recovery budget at the end or just click on the recovery budget. Um, on there, there's also some really helpful translations of summary material and uh, feedback forms, both in a number of different languages and also in some accessible versions. Um, on the website, you're also able to access our feedback form and fill it in online and submit, or to print out a feedback form to post in or scan and send in. Um, hard copies also available from our libraries and service centres. Of course, people can also these days make their, give us their views through social media, through Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Just comment on our recovery budget posts and use the AK Have Your Say hashtag. So thank you everyone for listening. Hope we haven't taken too long and we can get into the questions. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, just to check, you two will be staying on the line for the rest of the webinar, won't you, to answer any questions that might come up. Awesome. Thank you very much. I just want to quickly go over the, the question asking application that we have. Um, we can only ask questions via 
via the, the chat box. So I, I'm unable to actually open up anybody's microphone of, of the viewers tonight to ask a question. So if you have got a question, please use the Q&A function uh, to ask it. And then we can either answer it in uh, the chat or in the Q&A function, we can answer it there. Uh, or I can put it towards, put it to the panelists. Um, in a moment, I am going to pass over to our counsellors, and I'm just going to put you a, a question, which is, what are the top of mind concerns for you and your priorities, or what do you think the priorities should be uh, within this budget for your community? So I'll be asking you that. I'll be starting with Councillor Cashmore, uh, and then moving on after that. Um, and then we'll have some questions from the audience as well. And following that section, then I'll move to our local board chairs. Just want to acknowledge that uh, councillor for the Maunga Keke Tamaki Ward, Josephine Bartley is here tonight. Kia ora Josephine, if you just want to give us a little wave, we can see you. And also I missed earlier, uh, Pukite Papa local board chair, Julie Ferry is here as well. Good evening to you both. Um, just if having a look in, in the questions that have been answered, um, you can see there that there will be a transcript of this webinar that will be released uh, later on. Unfortunately, we can't have live captions tonight. Um, and as well, the, the various PowerPoint presentations and other paraphernalia that we have tonight will be made available after the webinar. So I'll just quickly pass over to you now, Councillor Cashmore. What what are your priorities or what do you think the priorities of your constituents should be uh, in relation to this budget? Good evening. Good evening, James and everybody online. So thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you everybody for your time on this somewhat balmy late summer's Sunday evening. Sadly, we've gone back into another lockdown for a week and, and that exemplifies the real challenge that we have in this budget. This is not business as usual. It is anything but. And we have lost and will be losing around you know, half a billion dollars plus um, over the next two years and another half billion beyond that. It's a billion dollar hole over four years and it's challenging. However, I see and speak to the community, my community and others around the city and business communities, we need to keep Auckland moving ahead. And that's continuing with our construction projects, continuing with our infrastructure projects, and continuing with economic development and at the same time being as cost effective but as effective as possible. And that means some of the things that are missing from our community are really hurting some industries and some employment opportunities. You know, tourism is gone for a while and some has been made up by a local but it's not going to be filling the gap. Our health and hospitality people are really hurting. We need to keep those industries going as, as best we can uh, within our means by supporting them individually and as a family and as communities. You have some great responses today when people were going out to cafes and bakeries supporting them because they were hurting and long may that continue. One of the great lessons we've had from COVID over the past 12 months is our capacity to be good to one another, to help our neighbours, to help our extended families, to help our friends and even strangers. You know, strangers a friend I have not yet met. Long may that be exemplified in this city and in this country. So, so my key points are, let's keep delivering what we have to deliver. Good environmental outcomes, good employment and economy outcomes, and supporting the four pillars of council's activities. We need to grow it, we need to build it, we need to make it happen better than it was before, cleaner than it was before, more climate friendly, more environmental friendly, but most importantly, more people friendly. That's my bit, James, thanks. Cool, thank you, Councillor Cashmore. Um, Councillor Dalton, uh, are you okay to jump in with, with a few words now or would you like me to come back to you? Yeah, no, no, that's sure. Thank and, you, James. And just to give other councillors a heads up, I'm just looking at my screen now and I'm, I'll be going sort of left to right. So uh, Councillor Casey and then Councillor Coombe will be next after Councillor Dalton. Thank you. Well, thank you, James. And having sat in all of the uh, workshops that we've had in an understanding of our budgets and what it means post-COVID, I absolutely support the Deputy Mayor and what he has said. Uh, what's important for us and for uh, my community out here in Manurewa Papakura is to finish what we've started. We must, we've, we've got a commitment to some pretty significant capital projects like the City Rail Link and the Central Interceptor and we need to finish those. They're big ticket items. Um, we need to continue to provide the services 
that we already do, such as um, the rubbish collections. The south of Auckland absolutely need a solution to resource recovery. And we need to be ensuring that we are investing the targeted rates in the right places that we can, so we can clean up our, our waterways. So a lot of it is um, understanding the situation, um, knowing that we're back into another lockdown and that's going to have a financial impact. But the, there are things we can do. One of them is to keep people in jobs. And one of them is to make sure that we're providing enough for our local communities through our local boards to support those who need um, care throughout the lockdowns and beyond. So my key message would be to finish what we've started and continue to look after what we have with our limited resources. Thank you, James. Thank you, Councillor Dalton. And, and the question we're just asking the councillors quite now very quickly is what, is what is your top priority or what, what do you believe the top priorities are for your community? So I'll just pass it on now to Councillor Casey. Thanks, James. Um, we've spent 77 hours on this recovery budget and what we're asking the people of Auckland now to do is tell us what your needs are and I'd like to talk as a senior liaison councillor for the six demographic advisory panels. As everybody knows my heart lies in community services and community facilities and as you heard from Michael tonight, we cannot afford to maintain all our buildings. So what's really important is, have we got the recipe right for the services that you need, the services that you use, that you want to see us continue to provide? We need to be smarter, we need to be cleverer about how we do that. And so it's absolutely vital that you tell us, it's for me, that you tell us what the services are that you value most, and you do value them. You tell us that all the time. The libraries and our community services are among the highest valued in anything that the council does. And so as part of the PACE committee, which is Parks, Arts, Community and Recreation, we, that, that's in my portfolio area. And this budget is quite critical. So if you do nothing else, please tell us what your needs are. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor. Uh, before I pass to uh, Councillor Coombe, who will talk to us about the, the priorities from her perspective, uh, I think after Councillor Coombe's answer, I'm then going to delve into a couple of the questions that we've got so far, uh, and then I'll go back to the rest of the councillors uh, for the round table. So uh, Councillor Coombe, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Good James, and good, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in this webinar. Um, I'm the councillor for Waitamata and Gulf, covering the central part of Auckland and the Gulf Islands. I was fortunate to be out on Aotea only just yesterday for a consultation event. And what I'm hearing sort of is top of mind for the communities that I represent, and I think it's also a wider concern, is particularly around water quality, the state of the Hauraki Gulf, um, the need to be really taking action to restore the Gulf, and that's why it's so critical that we invest in our water infrastructure um, so that we are stopping the discharges into the harbour. Um, transport is a big one, whether it's in the far-flung flung communities who are reliant on the ferry um, and just the, the services in the city centre, um, so really the investment in transport, and then the environment and climate action is a huge one and so I'm pleased that in this budget for the first time we have got uh, funding for specific climate action. It is quite a modest amount, I think we do need to do a whole lot more um, but we have to take a really holistic view for how we're, we're going to really recover from COVID uh, by actually building back better and investing in the climate action that we need. So. I know um, particularly out on the islands, um, we're very appreciative of the investment that's gone into the environment through the natural envir environment targeted rate. So that's another aspect that we're consulting on 
is extending that targeted rate so we can do even more. And we're seeing some fantastic payback from that, that targeted rate when it comes to um, tree planting, response to kauri dieback, pest control, and a whole lot of amazing programs that are also creating jobs. So that's really important too as part of our COVID recovery. So that's probably just that's a, there's, great. There's, there's a lot more I could probably add, but those are probably the three main areas. Thank you. Okay, that's fantastic. And that's a, a great segue into a question that I've got. And uh, if a councillor would like to answer it, just raise your hand. And if, if I don't see a hand raised or, or a noise from your microphone, if we can't see you on the video in a minute, or sorry, in about five seconds, then I'll, I'll choose someone to answer it. But how will jobs be provided to those that need them within this new budget? And uh, Councillor Cashmore, you were very quick on your buzzer, so I will pass it to you first. Thank you. Thanks very much. I was looking at it, it's on my questions. There's a question for Councillor Cashmore. <laughs> what is Council going to do to provide or help create employment? So the challenges, as I said in my opening statement, you know, we've lost a lot of employment around tourism. That that might not be coming back anytime soon. However, the employment rate hasn't dropped anywhere near to the extent as what the government or indeed council was predicting, which shows the resilience of the employment and businesses in the city. What we have to do is continue to enable business growth and to make sure that enablement is effective, because that's where the employment is. You know, 95% of people are employed in private sectors, often in small, medium-sized businesses. So that's about good um, transport systems effective um, avenues in, out, and through Auckland. That's having enough business land zoned and infrastructure ready to go to let business expand. It's about having effective economic proposals for business. Let's look at film. Film has gone from quarter of a, a million, sorry, quarter of a billion dollar business five years ago to four billion in Auckland now. That has been partially driven by Auckland Unlimited to help expand the film industry. It employs hundreds of thousands of people and it's high-end jobs with an industry that's well recognized worldwide. Our IT um, sector is doing well in this country. Um, we are looking at some of the finest growing lands um, in, in the South Auckland and the Franklin, in my ward in the Franklin area, and, the, and having some of the lowest uh, carbon and climate change impacts of any agricultural area in New Zealand. We can grow on the technology and advancements around that. So there's plenty of things we can do. Council is not a direct business maker, but what we can do is have the systems, places, the zoning and the planning in, in sight, in situ, and ready to go um, over a long period of time. That's what enables employment. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. Uh, we've got an, another question come through, uh, and I think, Councillor Simpson, can I just check your, um, you're available? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. So uh, the question is, uh, is $900 million in savings year on year sustainable, sustainable and won't services be impacted in the long term? And I'll also get Michael, uh, Michael Burns as well to, to, to come in at the end of that question. But Councillor Simpson, are you okay to provide a view on that question? Sure. First of all, 90 it's million, sorry. It's, got, it's, 900, it's not 900 million. It's yeah. not. I think, I think one of the most important things is people want to say, um, and look, I can answer this in, in um, complimentary to my warders, it's all very well to ask the ratepayer to pay more, but what are you doing to help yourself? And I think um, it's really important for us to show the ratepayers of Auckland that we are actually doing something to help ourselves. I mean, in the emergency budget, we have a target of $120 million worth of savings in just one year. And we are, you know, we are well over 100 million towards that target and we will achieve that target. Um, getting into this budget though, um, for that $120 million worth of savings in one year is, is the equivalent to about a 7% rates rise, right? 90 million is about a 5% rates rise. So it's a lot of money. But there, these are things about what we're doing is, is being smarter at how we do things. It's actually not taking away a service. It's actually being providing a little bit more around the value for money space um, and actually delivering, you know, a better, a better bang for the buck for, in perfect terms. You know, some of the examples around that is that we have put two of our council controlled organisations together um, and that's forecast to reduce saving us between 5 million and 7 million 
per annum. You know, the, um, and, and just to give you some context, you know, Auckland Council is now operating over $316 million or less a year than it would have been in this, for the same level of service in 2011-12. So we are keeping the same level of service, but doing it a lot cheaper. Um, and, you know, and the cumulative impact of savings is about nearly $2 billion over, over 10 years. So, you know, we are doing a lot um, to deliver a better value for money without losing that level of service. It's really important to keep, to keep that up. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. And, and Michael, I'll, I'll ask you to, to chime in as well. And also there was a related question earlier on uh, that was, how have the proposed decisions been made over the, dis the, dis the disposal of certain properties or stopping of certain services? So I think this answer probably ties into that as well. So if you'd like to, to touch on that, Michael, feel free. Otherwise, I'll come back to Councillor Simpson, who I, I'll get a view from that on. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, I think Councillor Simpson's, you know, hit on the head around um, our, our savings targets. The council executive team working really hard to identify savings across the business, and so that, um, as the councillor mentioned, we can be we can do our part and not just, you know, keep asking for more money. That's not that's not what the council wants to do. Some of the savings um, things that we've looked at are, you know, using technology more efficient, effectively. Um, better contract management, um, insurance claim management. These things, these things add up quickly. Um, some savings in our healthy waters area through insourcing our work rather than using consultants all the time. So there's a lot of work across the business um, where people are, are you know, finding ways to be more efficient. Uh, the other question around disposal of certain properties and so stopping services. Um, if, if what people are referring to is that that community services area I spoke about earlier, um, I think Councillor Casey really hit on the head. It's we're not asking, we're not out there now saying we're going to stop this or sell that um, for our service properties. What we're saying is we want to have that conversation with Aucklanders about what is it that they need. Exactly that question Councillor Casey asked: What is it that you need from us? And we're acknowledging Auckland's changing all the time. Um, and, and what we need to do is ensure that the services we provide and the assets we have provide for what Auckland looks like today and what it looked like tomorrow, not what it looked like yesterday. So that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Simpson, did Michael cover things uh, enough in that question? I think it was very, very well, very well done, Michael. Yeah, I think so. I mean, first of all, when we look at something to dispose of, it, it is there is quite a bit of analysis around is it needed for today and is it needed for tomorrow? And that, that there's quite a process around that, both political and from a staff perspective. So it doesn't even come to the councillors um, unless, unless that process has been independently done by staff. And I think that's a, a really important point. You know, for example, if a community have said, look, we need a new library and community space and that's now being built, you know, you look at the existing one and you say, well, actually, do you still need that? You know, you know, you've got this new one. Do you still need the old one that you said wasn't fit for purpose in the first place? So there is, there is, um, you know, quite a robust process and, you know, we can make that process available publicly if people want to know more about it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I am now going to uh, ask... Uh, our, our councillors to continue with their priorities and then I am going to introduce our local board chairs as well. So uh, Councillor Bartley, uh, are you okay just to have a quick chat about the priorities of yourself and, and your community now or would you like me to come back to you after the next person? Well, no, I'm, I'm good to, to Awesome, about great to see you. Um, thank you James and um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. I think the priorities in my area in Malakiki Tamaki, well one would be that people even find this relevant. A lot of people, given the current situation of this lockdown, have got far more severe priorities going on in their lives. But um, trying to get this through to people, the relevance of how this budget will affect them on a daily basis, I think is, is very important. Um, those that are aware of council, what council does, that we're going through this long term, plan process. Uh, for them, what I'm hearing is uh, the priority uh, 
uh, would be the priorities would be around uh, climate action. You know, council declared a climate emergency in uh, 2019, and they want to see action backing up um, that declaration. Transport options are very important, um, as people would know. Onehanga is pretty much a highway for trucks. Um, and uh, yeah, people want to see us make good on our transport statements about active transport options for everybody to use the road. Uh, so they'll be looking for that in, in our budget. Uh, water quality, Monaco Harbour is still a D rating, Tamaki Estuary is an F rating. The water quality rate previously, 80% uh, was spent on the Western Isthmus. So for our area, we want to see um, this extended water quality rate spent in our area and what is proposed in, is in the Monaco Harbour. So um, that's, a, that's a priority for our area. Infrastructure, making sure we continue to fund infrastructure that caters to the growth in both sides of the ward, Maung Kiki and Tamaki. We still have the Tamaki regeneration happening. And now we have Kaingo Order developments in Oranga and Mount Wellington, Onihanga. Uh, but, um, you know, we need to see that, that we are matching uh, the government's investment in the infrastructure in those areas. So that's very important. A bit of a worry is whether our town centre upgrades are going to be affected by budget changes, especially with no new builds in the community facility space. And community facilities is what we're counting on in the Unlock Pamua uh, Town Centre upgrade as the anchor for the Pamua Township area. So, you know, um, that is relevant to people every day, the town centre, um, the infrastructure that's happening. Uh, yeah, so I'd say off the top of my head, those would be our priorities and very important reasons for people to engage and get involved in this process. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butley, and thank you for uh, that challenge at the beginning for our engagement team to be engaging with people uh, across Tamaki Makoro uh, during this time when when people's priorities are, are not necessarily on uh, the ten-year budget <laughs> right now. Um, so, uh, Councillor Henderson, uh, good evening for the first time tonight. Uh, and yeah, kia ora. Uh, would you just like to share with us uh, the priorities as you see them? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just really quickly, James. Uh, priorities as uh, Waitaki Councillor. Um, is that, look, COVID has been challenging for all of us, but we're hoping out here that it can also be an opportunity and an opportunity for the rebirth of suburban Auckland and its town centres. Um, we have challenges of growth and housing and climate and most importantly, I think for us and amongst all of us, the future of work. Now, they were all challenges before COVID and now that we're essentially rebuilding a community and going out and starting from first principles a little bit, we can actually go back and say, look, we should be investing in things like our town centres and in our local suburban neighbourhoods so that people don't have to leave uh, to work and to play. Um, most of my ward is about 60% uh, leave Waitakere for work, and that has huge climate impact uh, in terms of the transport um, that's needed and the emissions that are generated, but also the public health of those people uh, that are sitting in exhaust fumes traffic every day. Um, and just, just briefly, so look, in terms of Waitakere, I think climate change, I think in terms of our local community facilities and our future of work in our town centres, I think those are big issues for us. Cool. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. And finally, Councillor Simpson. Good evening. Oh, thank, you. Good uh, evening. thank you for answering those questions before and I'll just hand it over to you. That's okay. Look, I think one of the big uh, focuses for the Orake Ward is water quality. You know, we have our northern boundary, uh, the Waitamata. Um, it's, it's, it hasn't got good water quality. We've got Hobson Bay, which is a, a border between Orake and Waitamata. And it's full of signs around its perimeter. You know, don't go near it, don't swim in it. It's got a health risk around it. And I think that, you know, people say, it's about time we really, you know, stepped up in the water quality space. Now, of course, we, we created a, a water quality targeted rate, interestingly based on capital value, but I digress. Um, and we've had that for three years. And that really, to a, to a very large degree, has gone into the Hearn Bay um, 
Western Isthmus Programme, which was done in conjunction with the Central Interceptor. So, you know, the investment has been in, in one of its worst, worst parts of Auckland Shore. But look, the next two big, big projects are the Eastern Isthmus, which is Hobson Bay, all the way through to Glendowie, the Tamaki River, and of course, the Manukau. And the mayoral proposal was to extend the water quality targeted rate out three years. But if that's all we did, we would not start investment in, our, in addressing the poor level of water quality for six more years. And I think our area is saying, well, actually, that's just not acceptable. You've really got to step up and do something. And the great thing about a targeted rate is it can't be spent on anything else. It can't be spent on something that you don't want it spent on. It is specifically to improve water quality. And I think that's something that the ORK people uh, are really strong on, as, as are other areas too, who have water of uh, Manukau and the Waitamata and the Tamaki River in the borders. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. I know that Councillor Fletcher had to leave us early, uh, so apologies that I didn't get to her in time. Uh, she had a board meeting to get to, I believe. Um, so I will just go back to uh, the questions that we've got from our audience. Uh, I'll do a couple of those, and then it'll be, it'll be the time of our, our local board chairs. Um, and just a reminder as well, if you've come into the, the webinar after we started, uh, apart from central local board chairs and central region councillors, we also have our Chief Sustainability Officer, Alec Tang here from Auckland Council, and Anna Jennings, who is our Principal Planner. Um, so if you have any questions for those Auckland Council staff, they're here to answer them if, if you so wish. Um, so I've got a question here, and again, I will uh, look to see from your hands or faces who would like to answer it, uh, councillors or local board chairs, but is it, the question is what regional investment will the communities of central Auckland, Auckland receive in this LTP? Well, I'm happy Councillor, to start. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> Councillor Simpson, uh, please, and then Councillor Coombe. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I've sort of touched on it a bit. It'll be the water quality investment. I think if that's successful and that goes ahead, um, there's definitely benefit to many of the um, uh, central areas from that. And the other one, which is very specific for Orake, is the links to the Big Glen and the Tamaki Drive Shared Path. And this is a central government and Auckland Transport combined project. Um, and so the, the, the sort of the transport investment for us around that will be, you know, links to that, which will be really great. It'll mean that the schools are, are able to have children walking and cycling to school completely off-road. But look, just on that, I think the other thing that it's important to, uh, to benefit is just talking about transport, is the ability in the central area for our local boards to make their own decisions around local transport issues that are important and have some funding to do that. And what the 5% uh, rates increase gives local boards in both, both central and in fact everywhere else is a um, quite a high level of annual budget for those local transport capital uh, projects that are important ward by ward. And I think those are two that, um, well those are three issues rather from my, my perspective. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Councillor Coombe. Uh, thank you. I was just having a look at um, our consultation document because I think this is really handy for people to log, um, check it out online because it goes through what the options are and what we get from each of the priority areas. Um, so say centrally, it highlights that if we have a 5.5% rates increase, it means that we can do the renewal work that's needed on the Auckland Art Gallery. Um, and then it just goes through each topic like that. So I'm, I really um, recommend checking out uh, this document because it, it really highlights where we can actually invest. Um, and then people can have a look at what they, you know, what's important for them in terms of areas around water quality, environment, transport, community assets. Um, parks, recreation. Um, so that's where all the information is. But that's just one example would be the art gallery. That's great, thank you. Uh, team, can we please get a copy of that link into the answer section as well? 
uh, the link to the consultation document that uh, Councillor Coombe just raised uh, because it is a great uh, an accessible document and I should also note that the consultation document is available uh, translated into different languages um, and other accessible formats as well. So thank you for that prompt Councillor Coombe. Um, awesome. Uh, I think now we've got one question uh, to do with the universal uh, basic income and uh, you might have seen on the news if you follow New York local government that um, <laughs> that one of the mayoral candidates in New York is is uh, is presenting a universal uh, basic income. That's Andrew Yang. Uh, but unfortunately, a universal basic basic income is not something that local governments uh, can uh, can provide uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's a central government issue, and it's not something that council is able to do. However. Just as a side note, uh, we support at council uh, universal basic income and the staff here are paid as such um, or paid a living wage, I should say. So I hope that answers the question as best as, best as possible. Um, so now, the moment you've been waiting for, sorry it's taken so long, uh, Richard Northey, uh, Waitamata Local Board Chair, hello. Uh, thank you for attending tonight. Um, I'd just like to hand over to you for, for a few moments to talk about um, the priorities from your perspective for either uh, you, your local board or, or Auckland. Good evening. Richard, if you can hear me, I'm just going to ask oh. you to unmute. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so probably our biggest concern is, is about community facilities. We appreciate the pressure that um, council income is under, but nevertheless, there are some uh, buildings that are important for placemaking and community in our area. The Lees Institute, as you know, was um, closed because of um, seismic issues. And we're very keen to um, get that rebuilt as soon as possible. The, 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 the recovery budget has some um, funds towards that project over the next three years, but probably not, not enough. And we'd like to make sure that happens. The Ponsonby Park project, um, most of those uh, projects called uh, One Local Initiative are not, not proceeding in the next three years, including Ponsonby Park. There's just funding for design. But we want to get feedback from our community about whether they want that still to happen in um, pretty soon after the three year period when we're particularly constrained. We're pleased to hear about the art gallery renewal. Um, there are, because we're an older community, there are some of our um, much loved facilities um, which will need seismic strengthening at some stage. Studio One, our community arts facility the Grayland Library Hall and some aspects of the Olympic Pool building. And if facilities are to close, we, we really want to know which are most loved that we certainly don't want to happen. Um, the ones I guess most at risk are Elthwaite um, Hall in, um, in Grafton and possibly the Freeman's Bay Hall. So we want feedback from people to help us um, if we have to make difficult choices there. We'd rather um, the council found more funds from a higher rate rise or more borrowing, but that's, we do need that sort of detailed information per facility. On climate action, uh, we as a board are responding with some particular pilot projects. We'd like the council to do more and if people look at the full consultation document, there is a section there about what possibilities for climate action, what the council's planning to do um, and what they felt they couldn't afford and, and we would appreciate people saying which of those things which haven't been included they hope that can be added um, in terms of climate action. On transport we're pleased that um, we're now proposed to have some money for our board which we're particularly concerned about safety particularly around um, our schools. There's no central city school so children are moving to Freeman's Bay and Newton Central School through quite hazardous street situations. So we want to do more to make um, safety around our schools. Um, Queen Street you've seen uh, has a high level of air pollution. So we want support for um, 
really a carless or very much less cars and less diesel there. Um, water quality, um, as I said, some work has been done already in terms of the central interceptor and Hobson Bay on our boundary does need uh, to be brought forward in terms of, of cleaning that up. So we're keen for um, the additional funding that can come through increasing the water quality targeted rate at the same rate as other uh, rates are. Uh, housing, I think council can can and should be doing more than is proposed in this budget for housing. It's a big national issue um, and we should be uh, contributing more either directly or through um, support for the provision of infrastructure with enable uh, Kanga Ora or um, private developers to provide more housing. And in the design of that, the housing component, uh, north of the um, Mount Eden Central Rail Link Station will be important to be done well. That that's a mixed community of, oh, in terms of, of income and, and occupation. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, Maggie Watson, um, I'll, I'll hand over to you now and then to Julie. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Yeah, my name's Maggie Watson and I'm the chair of the Albert Eden Local Board. So that um, covers the 10 kilometre stretch of Auckland from Green Lane in the east right through to Point Chevalier in the west. So um, 100,000 people live in that area. Look, I think for, at a local board level, it's really about community. So, um, and it's really about local neighbourhoods and where people live and, and the space where they might work, go to school, where their parks are. And we know through COVID that our parks have become even more important spaces for community to go and to be. And um, so that's always been one of our priorities, how our parks and open spaces are used by community community and we want to continue with that work. Um, we know one of the other, uh, some of the other key issues in our area around increasing intensification of housing um, from uh, at a, a local level right across the area because it's very close to the central city and people want to live there. So we've got intensification going on now. We've also got some big developments coming through, which include um, with Kainaora in Uwaraka, plus also on the um, what was Unitech land, where um, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development are looking to design for up to 4,000 dwellings um, in the next decade. So that creates a whole lot of infrastructure issues for us, and what we need to make that is a, virtually as a new suburb work. Um, so, and, and there's also water and environmental issues at a local community, and that's what the community keeps saying but to us. So what we want to hear back from the community is what is important to them, so we can allocate our funding appropriately. Uh, we do know that the current budget means that we can't renew all the assets in our parks and our playgrounds and our footpaths and tracks and library facilities and community centres. So we, ne we know that it's only going to be funded at about 70%. We put a whole lot of capital projects on hold during COVID last year. They haven't restarted. So we really want to hear from the community where their priorities um, lie. And I guess um, on in this document, someone else referred to on page 56 is um, the Albert Eden local board priorities. And I encourage people to have a read of that, that live in the area or work in the area. Um, it sets what our priorities are for next, the next coming year, but it also looks at that 10 year window about what we want to see locked in. And so we're still advocating to the governing body for those um, projects to be included. But there are four key projects for us in that. One is um, we now have the lease over the town square at Mount Albert, and that connects the shopping area up to the train station. Uh, we want to continue with the design and the build of that town square to make it a hub for that, um, that shopping district town centre. Um, we're looking at, we have one of the highest shortfalls of access to sports fields, and we have a um, a large sporting community. We, we're looking to secure funding to continue with provision of sports fields, expanding that. Um, the, 
securing the funding for Chamberlain Park, where we're looking at reallocating some of that space. So 18 holes of golf remains, but it's a community park and it's very close to the new development at Unity. Um, and uh, the other one's retaining um, aquatic facilities in the Mount Albert area, because that provides for the whole of Albert Eden to, um, through into Mount Eden. So those are some of the issues that come up for us. And um, we know at 5%, we can't do all those things as a rates increase. So um, we really want to hear feedback from the community to guide us and our feedback back to the governing body. So appreciate the time tonight to um, kōrero with you. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Julie, I'll pass you in a moment. And just as a heads up for uh, Alec Tang and Anna Jennings, I'll then have a, a question that, that I'll put to you both. Um, but Julie Ferry, uh, I'll pass over to you now. Kia ora. Um, I'll be very brief because you may have noticed I've been a little bit distracted. I've got three children running around in the background. Um, you may hear their scream. Um, don't worry, they're perfectly safe. Uh, they're having a great time. That's why they're being so loud. Uh, so one of the key things that um, our local board would really like to hear back from people on, and, and Alex probably going to touch on this in more detail, is that at the moment, um, the climate change portion of the feedback asks if you support the proposed increased investment, do not support increased investment, other or don't know. We'd really like to know, do you think that the proposal has the balance right in terms of the increased investment on climate change, some of which needs to happen regionally and some of which could also happen locally. So that's an area would be really helpful if people could not just tick a box, but write a little bit as well uh, to let us know what they think. Um, because that is one of the big challenges that we face and will continue to face uh, beyond the, the first three years of, of um, pretty uh, tight looking budget and also beyond this period of COVID as well. Um, so that's something we really need to get right, whether we have the, the level of increased investment right, uh, whether it needs to be bigger, whether it could be smaller. That's one of the key things um, I'd find particularly useful in people's feedback. Um, I'd also like to point people to the local board priorities that we've identified, much as um, Margie and Richard have talked about the ones for their areas. Reflecting on the fact that we know that we're going to have probably about 80% of what we'd normally have for renewals, so that's um, replacing assets that um, have come to the end of their life, that's something where if you can tell us the ones that you really value or conversely the ones that you think could probably go, then that's, that could make a real difference because potentially that's you know, one in five fix up jobs that we would like to do, um, but won't be able to. Of course it differs because they all cost different amounts. But if you think about it that way, you know, your top five playgrounds, we might only be able to fix four of them. So do please have a real think about giving us specific feedback on that, that will help us make those decisions. I can hear children getting closer, so I will leave it there. Thank you for the opportunity. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Julie. Um, uh, some really good points there about how your, engage, your, your opinions and, and as we engage with the community can actually help make decisions that uh, will matter to you. Sometimes uh, when you're just living your life in Auckland, you might not know what you can actually influence or not. Um, and certainly also, Julie, as a, a parent of children, uh, knowing that... <laughs> There are some playgrounds that, that can be invested in and others that might not. I think that's really good, good view of things. So thank you very much. Um, Alec Tang, good evening. Just want to bring you in now. Uh, I know that we have got a, a climate focused uh, webinar later on this week, but um, the um, sustainability and climate change aspect of the long-term budget has been brought up a few times tonight uh, by councillors and local board members and I just wanted to bring you in for an opportunity to, to give our audience a, a, a further view on that and a bit, bit more of a deeper dive. Thank you. Sure, James, thanks for that and yeah great to hear um, from a number of councillors from across um, the whole of Tamaki how important climate action is to their communities which is obviously fantastic to hear. As you prefaced on Wednesday this week, I'll dive into more detail about what those options are. But just for now, I think it's useful to take a step backwards. Um, and just to reiterate that from my perspective, climate action is an opportunity. You know, we always, and we're talking about an investment here in cost, but it's a huge opportunity. 
Um, we know that um, reducing our emissions, a greater efficiency from an energy perspective, from a movement transport, that, that saves money. So there's huge opportunities there. There's huge opportunities to deliver more sustainable housing, more uh, healthy homes, um, and, and, and homes that are closer to where people want to work and play and live. Um, we know there's also environmental benefits from climate action. You would have seen last week, um, the state of our environment report was released by council, highlighting again, air quality impacts in the central city. And one of the proposals that we flagged is about, as you, you noted earlier on, um, no new diesel buses, uh, moving to electric, moving to hydrogen buses, that's gonna have a huge benefit for our um, central city air quality. So lots of benefits from reducing emissions, but also lots of benefits from um, addressing those impacts of climate change that we know are gonna happen. Because it means that we can uh, avoid or at least reduce the costs of um, things like the floods that we know are gonna happen, things like increasing storms, we can increase the resilience of our physical assets, but also from a social perspective, we can build the resilience of our communities to respond to the change that we know is happening, and we can make our economy more resilient. And I know Councillor Cashmore talks about this, about the changes we see now from COVID. We're going to see those kinds of changes, those kinds of transformations in our economy going forward. And so the more we do now to, to make ourselves fit and healthy, make our economy fit and healthy for those changes is going to be critical. Um, as a couple of people highlighted, you know, we council can't do this alone, but we need to lead the way and show others about the benefits and the opportunities of climate action. We've shown this leadership in our ambition. As a few of you have noted, we declared a climate emergency. We've set really strong targets. We've set a target of halving our emissions by 2030, which is aligned with a 1.5 degree future, which is by far and away the strongest action that, 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 that we've seen around the country and it sets us in the leadership category around the world. And last year, we launched Tataki Atafi, Auckland's climate plan, which is a regional plan that says, this is how we're gonna do it. So we've shown leadership in our ambition. This is about that first step to leading others um, through into the action that's required. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alec. And again, uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night for the Climate Focus. Um, just a reminder, with the questions in the Q&A, uh, we're still open to any questions coming in, so, so by all means use that functionality. And now Anna, um, I would just like to check in with you from the planning perspective. If there's anything that you've heard tonight from the councillors or local board members that you wanted to, to provide a view on, or if you have any advice for the audience tonight about how they can engage in the process as it relates to planning, um, it would be great to hear your perspective now. Sure, thank you, James. Um, I guess I just want to build on some of the comments that councillors have already made and also in the introductory comments that Michael made about this population increase we're expecting of the 260,000 people over the next 10 years. We've also touched on housing, some of the councillors and the need for housing um, and some of the developments that are happening, particularly with Kanga Aura around the city. So we've, um, in the consultation document, we talk about a focused approach to housing and growth infrastructure. We can't do it everywhere. We've got um, projects that we need to complete. Um, so we're advocating for a more uh, focused approach where we support and leverage off um, investment by the Crown and others. We've given some examples of areas where we might focus. And these include the Auckland Housing Programme areas where Kaianga Ora are developing around the CRL stations um, in Drury and out in the northwest. We are, and we are working really closely with um, the government on these areas and looking at not only how we each fund, but alternative ways to funding and financing of these areas. So we'd be really interested in people's feedback on this focused approach um, and when they provide their feedback. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Anna. Um, I just uh, want to open things up a little bit now to councillors. Uh, and local board members. Is there anything you've heard tonight that you want to expand upon or have you had a new thought that you'd like to communicate out to the audience? If so, uh, you can raise your hand virtually or in your rooms uh, and I can pick that up. Um, and otherwise, we will, I'll ask another couple of prompts and then we'll, we'll close things out for the evening. So if there's something front of mind that you'd like to get across to people, um, feel free to, to raise your hand now. Uh, and I'll hand over to you. Otherwise, uh, we'll we'll um, we'll close things off for the evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the balmy night, as uh, Councillor Cashmore alluded to. Oh.
I'm, I'm happy to say something from the because this is a central thing. Um, one of the, if that's okay, James. So oh, absolutely. Um, is that right? And yes, Councillor Simpson, I just turned your video off, Councillor Simpson, because we could see your your lounge room wall, but not your face. So oh. I just turned your video off. I hope you don't mind. You can turn oh. it on yourself if you want to. Oh, yeah, absolutely fine. Okay. Um, I was just going to say one of the one of the other advantages that this LTP gives the central area is 50% of the below the ground pipe infrastructure is being replaced in the central area, and you know we your know, central part of Auckland is a very old part of Auckland, and unlike the the new growth areas out further, um, you know our below the ground infrastructure is very weak, so. Um, I think a 50% investment over the 10 years in the central area is actually really good for our area. It will help our water quality and it's just that renewal project, which is um, I think will be a great benefit. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Uh, anybody else? Uh, yes, Councillor Cashmore, uh, you can unmute yourself at your leisure. Thanks very much, James. And good to make people aware of the actual challenges, the reality, not only of COVID, but what's happening. So since 2010 till now, Auckland's population has increased by over 300,000 people. In the last year alone, over 100,000 people, have New Zealanders have returned and been in MIQ facilities and have been processed through those facilities. What percentage of those have stayed in Auckland? 50%, arguably maybe more. So that could be 50 or 60,000 additional Aucklanders um, over above natural increase. At that rate of population growth, to build the infrastructure that we have to do, um, it's almost a physically impossible to supply at the rate of population growth that it would, would require. And whether it's greenfields, uh, which is new, you know, rural land being converted into houses and factories and businesses, or brownfields with intensification um, of existing, you know, where you have single house zones, we suddenly turn into uh, more intensive housing operations where you have a, a low level apartments or, or or terraced housing these are all challenges for communities to face and it's not easy because suddenly your um, california bungalow that was built in the 60s and 70s has been replaced all around you with three or four story walk-up apartment blocks or terraced housing and the pressures that that brings to your community change is never easy for anyone to accept and but it's an inevitable consequence of a growing city and a growing economy within that city and indeed within our country. So I've asked people, I've really encouraged them to think broadly about you know, what are they seeing um, the future of Auckland looking like? You know, how are we going to move? How are we going to grow our economy? How are we going to create more employment and improve people's quality of life? And Alex summed up some good points around, you know, we need to adapt to a, a new model of, of faster moving climate change. We need to understand that um, we can't all sit in our, our cars and drive around as a one occupancy person because we just can't build motorways quick enough to beat congestion. It's just not possible. Um, we have to embrace public transport. We have to embrace new ways of working. And we have to embrace a lot more of live, work, play in an area and a lot less commute. So I'd really challenge people to have a think around those sort of things. What do they think is going to be a long term future for them, for their families, and for their grandkids? Because that's what we need to do because they are our future. But thank you everyone for participating. And thank you, James and all the staff um, who have been online tonight in their own time. Again, on a still balmy, sun just setting Sunday evening. Cheers. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cashmore. And that's a, a very nice moment uh, for us to end things on. I appreciate your, your final thoughts there. Um, so just as a reminder uh, tonight to visit AK Have Your Say, dot aucklandcouncil.gov.nz, which is the letters A-K-H-A-V-E-Y-O-U-R-S-A-Y dot aucklandcouncil.gov.nz uh, in order to be part of the official consultation process for this 10-year budget. Um, to our councillors and our local board members, <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Much appreciated. Uh, and I know you'll be part of these engagement sessions as we go along in the next couple of weeks. Um, and also to Auckland Council staff, Andrew, Alec, Anna, Anna 
and Michael, thank you as well for attending tonight. And to the many behind the scenes staff that have made this webinar run so smoothly, thank you very much as well. Uh, we all appreciate it. Us whose faces are on the screen appreciate it a lot. So uh, good evening, everybody. Paul Marie and uh, best wishes for the week ahead. Good night. <laughs>